Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm going to jump right into my remarks because I want to respect the schedule and uh, get through what I have to say uh, today. So here's what I'm going to say, and uh, you can stop listening after I show this slide. Um, expert advice confers great authority uh, in decision making, and I think this, this holds across cultures. Um, that authority is seductive to both experts and to decision makers. As a consequence, strong institutions are needed um, to preserve that authority so that we have it when we need it uh, and so that we get good advice. Uh, this requires that the expert community, and when I say this, I'm saying, I'm not saying politicians. The expert community has to show leadership and responsibility for maintaining that authority. And what I'm going to talk about is some of the ways that authority can be used, abused, misused in the process. I could go back 2,000 years or more to the ancient Greeks, but I'm going to start with Abraham Lincoln, the 16th American president. Uh, on April 25th, 1863, he was approached by a weather forecaster named Francis Capon, who said, uh, I can forecast the weather. I mean, imagine someone saying they can forecast the weather. Uh, this may be useful to you in prosecuting the Civil War, which was ongoing at that time. Uh, Capon said, for instance, it's, it's, so it's April 25th, he said, it's not going to rain again until April 30th. So Abraham Lincoln wrote a letter on April 28th, said, after 10 hours of straight rain, I've decided I have no more use for Mr. Capon. Uh, this anecdote shows that, that for, for a long time, the decision makers and experts have had complicated relationships with experts often appealing to decision makers that they would be useful in politics. Now, I'm going to go through a number of recent cases that you may be familiar about in the news um, of experts running into difficulties at the interface of politics and expertise. Uh, this is Andreas Giorgio of the ELSTAT, which is the Greek Statistical Authority, who has recently been uh, charged with uh, breaking the law for overstating the Greek debt. It turns out when you get down into the details, uh, there was a legitimate methodological dispute over how to portray that debate, and he chose the methodology that inflated it. Um, one politician in Greece said uh, that his, his crime, his error, was that all he thinks about is numbers. He has no sense of the, of the interest of the country. Uh, this is, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, uh, one of the scientists who was recently convicted in L'Aquila, Italy, of, uh, of misleading the public with respect to the 2009 earthquake. Six scientists and one government official were uh, sent to jail for six years. Uh, now, the Italian court system is complicated and there's several levels of appeal that may result. Um, in this case, what happened was the scientists met, it was a major risk committee, a government committee, uh, and they told the public, don't worry, it's not going to be an earthquake, go have a glass of red wine. Now some of the backstory here is that uh, there was a scientific amateur, a skeptic, uh, who had been going around L'Aquila warning people of a pending earthquake because of his research on radon gas. And part of their effort was to discredit this skeptic in the public eye. Here in the UK, uh, you're of course uh, familiar with uh, a number of instances of complicated issues at the interface of science and politics. Uh, this is David Nutt who was sacked for uh, saying that riding a horse could be more dangerous than taking the drug ecstasy. Um, now I don't want you to have the impression that the abuses of science are only a European phenomena. Uh, you will, of course, know that uh, during the administration of George W. Bush, there were numerous instances of difficulties. Uh, the Bush administration would call up prospective science advisory panelists to sit on government panels, um, ask about their qualifications, their degree, say, and by the way, who did you vote for in the last election? Now, many people thought that the election of President Obama would lead to, uh, in, in the words of the campaign, restoring science to its proper place. And it turns out that many of the exact same issues that we saw in the Bush administration continue in the Obama administration. And that's because they're not large P political, but there are some difficulties that we see that are systemic where science meets politics. This refers to a case where uh, in the US there's the, the so-called morning after pill. Uh, it's uh, birth control that you take the morning after. Under the Bush administration, uh, 
the, the Food and Drug Administration advisory panel said, we, we can't make any distinction between young girls and women. There's no line to be drawn. The risks are the same. And the Bush administration said, well, that can't be true. Obviously, girls are different than women. We think that age is 18 years old. Has invokes issues of abortion in the US, parental consent, and so on. So the Obama administration came in, and they had their panel look at this issue. And not surprisingly, the science didn't change. There's no threshold. With an election coming up, the Obama administration said, well, that can't be true. Everyone knows that women and girls are different. 17 years. Uh, there was a lot of uh, hand-wringing, a lot of complaints that uh, science wasn't dictating decisions. But the reality is that these conflicts that we see between science and politics span political party. They span national boundaries. Uh, they span phenomena. You see it in economics. You see it in medicine. Uh, there's something common going on here. So I first became uh, aware of uh, some of these issues when I was a, a, a young social scientist uh, going out to spread the word about how important science was to decision makers. 1997, uh, there were massive floods on the Red River of the North. This is North Dakota, so upper Midwest in the United States. Uh, this is a river that flows from the south to the north. So when it experiences floods, it's usually because the melt isn't occurring fast enough to the north and the ice doesn't allow the water to, to proceed up to the Hudson Bay. In this instance, the scientific community provided a remarkably accurate forecast three months in advance because they knew how much water was on the ground. Now what they did was they conveyed to the public that the, the river is going to crest at 49 feet. 49 feet, 49 feet. They repeated that for weeks on end. And it turns out that uh, the river crested at 54 feet. So they were off by 10%. Three months in advance, 10% error, remarkable. Turns out that the community had built their levees to 51 feet. So there was a massive flood. Now, when I was part of the disaster survey team that went up there and we interviewed the scientists and we asked them, uh, why didn't you talk about uncertainty? Why didn't you tell them that your forecast historically have an average 10% margin of error. They said, well, we were sending a message. So what message was that? The message was this was going to be a record flood. The flood that had occurred before that was the record flood was 48.8 feet. So they said, if we say 49, that'll scare these people to death. Of course, the message that was received was quite different. In the community, they said, oh, I remember back in 1979. That wasn't much of a big deal. What's, what's a few more inches? So the message that was sent was not the message that was received. So here I am, you know, smart Alex, social scientist, thinking, aha, uncertainty, that's the key. We just need to add uncertainty bars. So as part of being up there, um, and I wrote a paper on this, and I got to interview all the decision makers, I got to sit down in the office of the mayor of East Grand Forks. Now what I'm going to show you, it's not a real picture from that, but this is how my mind remembers it. So I sat down with the mayor and I said, of course, obviously, you want uncertainty bars. You want a, a, a PDF so you can carefully measure risk. And his response was something like, hell no. I want one number that the Weather Service will stand behind. Why did he want one number? Because that transferred accountability from him having to make a decision to the experts. In this case, the experts were happy to oblige. So at that point, I realized that this is a pretty complicated set of issues. So all politicians have interests. This is uh, Anders Fogh Rasmussen speaking on the occasion of the Copenhagen Science Conference in advance of the Copenhagen Climate Meeting. And he said, but understand me correctly. At the end of the day here in Copenhagen, we have as politicians to make the final decision. I need your assistance to push this process in the right direction. And in that respect, I need fixed targets and certain figures and not too many considerations on uncertainty and risk and things like that. This is the same message I got from the mayor of East Grand Forks. Um, the problem isn't that politicians want to transfer accountability to their experts. The problem that we, is that we have institutions in many cases which are willing to accept that transfer. Here's Ivo de Boer speaking last fall about the next IPCC report on climate change. That next report is going to scare the wits out of everyone. I'm confident those scientific findings will create new political momentum. 
Now we, everyone here, this is, this is the home, this campus, the home of science policy research. Everyone is probably familiar with the deficit model, the linear model of thinking, the idea that if only you understood the facts as I understand them, you would then come to share my values and policy preferences. Despite all the research that's been done on that, that perspective is endemic throughout the world of expertise in politics. A few years ago, I got to sit on a panel at the American Association for the Advancement of Science on ethical practices for scientists. And I got to sit with uh, uh, Bill Foster, a physicist, one of the only physicists today in the US Congress. And he introduced a concept to the, uh, to the scientists, the young postdocs, young early career scientists in the crowd, called pre-distortion. And he said, and this is, this is from the notes I took at the time that I put up on my blog, Foster said that scientists should expect that the information that they bring to the political process, such as through testimony before congressional committees, will inevitably be distorted in the political process. He then raised what he called a difficult ethical question. If a scientist knows that their message will be distorted in the political process, to what degree should she or he pre-distort their message in hopes that what comes out to the other end is a closer approximation to reality? He illustrated this quantitatively. He said, if you know the answer is zero, and the bad guys are saying it's minus 10, maybe you should go say that it's 10. So one of the things I've done in my work is try to sort out um, the relationships in a way that's intuitive and makes sense. And what I'm going to present to you comes from my book, The Honest Broker, um, the second edition of which I am working on now. So feedback, comments, critique is always welcome. And this is an, a very simplistic way to think about the structure of relationships between science and decision making. Uh, <laughs> Obviously, in the few minutes I have left, it's going to be a very uh, brief overview, but it goes something like this. So imagine you're in Brighton. You come from Boulder, Colorado. You don't know where the restaurants are. You're hungry. You're tired. You have an interaction with a local. The local is the expert. Me, coming from Boulder, I'm the decision maker. We're going to go through three ways that this, this decision could be made. Science arbiter, issue advocate, and honest broker. The reason the pure scientist isn't included here is that the pure scientist is pure. They don't have their hands dirty with the realities of politics. They are doing good work somewhere else. So the science arbiter is a little bit like the concierge at a hotel. You approach, so the key here is that you have a decision maker who queries the expert with questions that can be answered empirically. So I could say to the concierge, can you tell me where the closest Indian restaurant is? And that's a question that can be resolved empirically. I would not go to the concierge and say, what do I like? What should I prefer? Now, there's a lot of work that's been done. Um, Sheila Jasanoff, I won't go into details, is kind of the dean of studies of uh, science arbiters. So a lot of ways that can go wrong. But we know how to do science arbitration very well through science advisory panels. Um, often the big mistake that's made is that no one elicits the questions that policymakers want answered. Often it's a process where scientists are communicating to policymakers the things that the scientists think the policymakers ought to prefer. The issue advocate. The issue advocate, the defining feature, is seeking to reduce the scope of choice of decision making. So I may show up and you say, here's a map of McDonald's. Why? I don't know. You have stock in the company or your, your cousin works there. But you're not lying to me. You're not misrepresenting information. But you're trying to reduce my scope of choice. You're trying to put your thumb on the scale and tell me what to do. Advocacy is a noble and honorable part of democracies. Without Advocacy, democracy couldn't work. We've learned, though, that when scientists, and in particular scientific organizations, engage in overt advocacy, there is a trade-off in their perceived legitimacy. It's difficult. All right, the third category is the honest broker of policy alternatives. You could say, I'm going to give you a travel guide. I don't want any business in telling you where to eat, but I can tell you what your choices are. And obviously, there's different approaches to honest brokering. But I would submit there's something very different very different about giving me a map of the McDonald's and giving me a travel guide. Now, one of the critiques I've received and my book has received about The Honest Broker is that it disempowers the scientist. Here I am. I'm showing up in Brighton. You have a chance to tell me where to eat. Are you going to avoid that chance to send me to McDonald's and give me a travel guide? I could make a bad decision. I could pick a horrible restaurant. Behind all of this is our notion of democracy and the role of the expert. Do we want the expert telling us what we ought to do? Or do we want the expert telling us what we could do? I would submit that both roles are important. 
And it seems that many of our scientific organizations um, are unable these days to perform the role of honest broker, either because politicians don't want choices, they want one number, or because scientists say, I have my audience with the policymaker, of course I'm going to advocate for what I think is right. We all deal with honest brokers. Train websites, Expedia, Travelocity, pick your favorite travel website. That's an honest broker. It tells you which, where you could go. It doesn't tell you, it's not an advertisement. So let me conclude. Expert advice confers great authority, uh, but that authority is seductive to experts and decision makers. It's very easy for the process not to work. Uh, and I hope in the discussions over the next two days, we do talk about institutions, because it's through institutions that we mediate the relationship between experts and decision makers. Uh, for this to work, however, the expert community has to assert the importance of arbitration, of advocacy, and honest brokering, and recognize that we can't do all at once. And we need institutions in all three areas that are very strong. Thank you very much. <laughs>